Hey guys, thanks so much for listening today. I have a great, well, hour long show for you. Uh, the problem is I got a little technical note and for some reason, the stupid recording shut off about the last five minutes or so. So, uh, I had a great little bit on, on Ray Dalio, which I will probably hit up tomorrow because it was, it was pretty good. And uh, so I apologize if the thing shuts off. Darren isn't in the studio today. So I was forced to try and figure this thing out on my own and without his technical expertise, uh, apparently I kind of, uh, I bullowed this one. So, but there is a great hour long episode there. It's just about the last five minutes got cut off. So I apologize when it, uh, when it just zeroes out on you, but I'll be back tomorrow. We'll cover this again and hopefully Darren will be back. So I don't have to, uh, I don't have to do this again on my own, but uh, thanks so much guys and enjoy the show. Everybody and welcome back. This is the Jason Stapleton program broadcasting once again from the Random Walk Studios deep in the heart of America. I, of course, am Jason Stapleton. If you forgot who I was because I've been gone for so daggum long, it's a running joke, I guess, in the private Facebook group. Where's Jason? Um, and truthfully, I was all over the place. I was out in New Mexico. I got to ride on, a, on an Osprey helicopter, which was both nerve wracking and exciting at the same time. I did not throw up. Two people did. I was not one of them. So that was excellent. And uh, then I went to Washington, D.C. I spent a day there and then I went to New York for an entire week and hung out in New York and shot a TV show from some absolutely beautiful places. If you go onto my Instagram account, my Instagram is Jason Stapleton Program. And so I've been posting a lot more there just because, you know, as I'm traveling around, I'm taking pictures of stuff and I can put them on Facebook. But Instagram is kind of like designed to do uh, to do photographs and and quick videos. So if you guys want to check that out, you can feel free to go sign up and check out Jason Stapleton program. That's the, that's the, the handle there. And, uh, and you can uh, be part of the action as I'm traveling around. I am, uh, I'm here for the whole week. And then I believe the middle of next week, I got to go out to San Francisco, but here's the thing. I am working on lining up interviews with a bunch of people for next week so that you don't have to be without content because I, I know how tired you guys are. I've had really great comments, guys. Lots of people saying, when's the show coming back? What are you doing? Hey, are, are you ever coming back? And we miss you. And, and I, I want to hear the show. And um, that makes me feel really good. It really does. And uh, Alex sent a, a note on Twitter today and he said, uh, I thought you forgot about us. And trust me, I didn't. I uh, I know how much – you. I, I, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate the fact that you guys come and listen every day, that you find value in what it is that I'm, I'm putting out for you. Because really, what I'm trying to do is pretty simple. I just want you guys to try and see the world in, in kind of a nonpartisan way. Because I've got a story in the stack today talking about the partisanship that's that's really dividing America, and they've actually got some some political some results from some testing they've done over the a couple of decades that really shows that America is becoming more polarized. And I want to talk a little bit about why that is today, among other things. But I uh, I think it's important that we as as individuals uh, focus on those things that don't may not necessarily support our own self interest, but support the interest of all people. Um, and what's interesting about that is when we kind of pursue our own self interest, it ends up lifting all ships. So the things that tend to help individuals succeed over time in, it tend to help groups succeed over time. I, I'll give you an example. Um, when we focus on uh, making sure that we are out making as much money as we possibly can, that would be a very self-interested thing to do, wouldn't it? We want to make uh, as much money as possible. Sounds like very greedy. But when when you consider that, if that is done ethically and using a, a capitalist model that says, you know, the more people I help, the more money I make, which is what I'm constantly trying to reiterate to you on this show, that, hey, capitalism provides people the opportunity to make money by helping others. And the better you are at helping other people get what they want, the more money you can make in your life. So for you to go out and pursue your own self-interest to try and make as much money as humanly possible and to turn around and say, hey, not only did I make this money, but I helped a ton of people in the process. You have raised the standard of living for all people. You have improved the condition of your fellow man or woman and you've been able to become wealthy or at least successful in the process. And, and that's when we look at 
these ideas of liberty, these ideas that you own yourself, that you have a right to pursue your own self-interest, that the government, that individuals, your neighbor doesn't have a right to tell you what you can and can't do with your life and your body and your talents and your skills, then all of a sudden we start to realize the incredible, um, the incredible power in that. And I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want it to seem too, uh, I, I guess, uh, 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 what's the, sh- it's not Shangri-La, right? It's not a utopia. And that's really what a lot of people want to drag us into when we talk about these things. Capitalism isn't perfect. It's a, it's a, it's flawed. The, in order for some people, in order for, there will always be in a capitalist society, winners and losers. There will be those who figure it out and those who don't. And the good thing about that system above all other systems that have been devised by man, is that even those who are poor in the capitalist societies do better than those who are wealthy in some other societies. And um, I, I guess what, as we talk about these things and as, 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 I, as I move through the stuff today, because we've got a lot of stuff on wealth inequality. I've got some stuff on that. We're going to talk about the Russian bribe thing. And one of the things that is really disconcerting to me is when, when I talk with people or when I really when I listen to other people talk about the things that we talk about on this show, many times there's this, there's this sense that we're at odds with the other side. When in fact, what I find is people who, who people I talk to aren't really opposed to the ideas that I present. So, for example, um, I, my my general philosophy about life is we don't hurt people and we don't take their stuff. Right. We don't harm other people and we don't steal. And when you present it in that way, people look at you and they say, well, oh, yeah, I can totally get on board with that. And I say, OK. Uh, but then when we start talking, they, they look at the wealth inequality in the world and they say, well, somebody needs to fix that and somebody needs to take the money that these rich, greedy capitalists are making. Some of them ethically, some of them unethically. It doesn't really matter. And redistribute it to the other people so that everybody has a quote unquote fair share. And the reason that they're saying that, the reason they're approaching it that way is because they legitimately want to try and help the people who are hurting. And I look at it and I say, that's, that's a fantastic idea. I love that too. The problem is we disagree on how to help people. It's not a question of whether you're compassionate and I'm not, or I'm compassionate and you're not. We both want the same thing. We both want to help raise people out of poverty. I just don't think you do that by hurting other people. By punishing people for the success that they've had. Now, if they got their, if they, if they received their gains, um, if they were, they were ill-gotten gains. Right? If, they, if they got them through nefarious means by screwing over people or by committing fraud or, or, or by harming or damaging others because of lies or deception, then of course go after them. But we have all kinds of laws on the books to protect against that. And when it does happen, we ought to be pursuing it to the fullest extent of the law. But here's the problem. If you made your money the ethical way, if you made it according to the capitalist idea that we get what, the most out of life by helping others get what they want, well, you don't have a claim on someone else's money. You don't have a claim on their life. You don't get to tell them what they can do with it. You don't get to say to them, you have too much and someone else has too little. That doesn't raise people out of poverty. It doesn't teach them how to create and be self-sufficient. It teaches them dependency. In New Zealand, I've got an article here. It was actually at the bottom of the stack, but it, as, I'm, as I'm rolling through today's notes, I feel like this is very important that, that we kind of cover this. Um, it says, Jacinda... Ardern, who is apparently going to be the new prime minister of New Zealand, uh, at the youngest one in that case, 1856, said that measures used to gauge economic success, success, quote, have to change and take into account, quote, people's ability to uh, uh, people's ability to actually have a meaningful life. And she goes on to say that. um She's pledged to both increase the minimum wage. She has pledged to write child care poverty reduction targets, which apparently, I mean, writing production targets or, or reduction targets is the same thing as actually doing something and building thousands of affordable homes. And I look at these things and I, I look at all these subjective terms. What does it mean to have a meaningful life? How do you quantify that? Certainly, there's a financial component to it, but I, I got to tell you guys, um, there are a lot of people who make a truckload of money in this world who are absolutely miserable. There are a lot of people who are eking by, who are living paycheck to paycheck, almost hand to mouth, but they have a joy and a passion for what they do and, 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 and for their lives, for the lives that they built. 
that, uh, that they don't care. I mean, there are some people who grew up so poor, who struggled so badly, and they've attained a level of middle class, like kind of a middle class struggle. And they look at where they came from and they think, yeah, this is, this is great. Think about where I came from. There's people who, immigrants who come over, who are living a lifestyle that a lot of us would find to be mediocre, but because of where they came from, they find a joy and a happiness in that. I think back to my grandfather. My grandfather was, has been very successful in his life and, uh, and he's older now and he's having trouble getting around and he's having some health problems. But I mean, I remember him in the height of, of his life. And I, there was a picture that hung on the wall in my grandparents' house. And it was of a little boy, black and white photo, sitting in the dirt, blonde hair. And he's sitting in front of some steps. And behind him, you can see that there's a sod house back there, like a literal freaking sod house. And I remember asking my grandma one year, I said, at one time when we were over at her house, I said, well, you know, who is that in the picture? She says, that's your grandpa. And as I, 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 when I was a kid, I didn't really realize it, but I think about it now and I look at that and I say, my freaking grandpa, multimillionaire, my grandfather, started his life in a sod freaking house. Let that sink in for a little bit. Think about where you are and the opportunities that you have had in your life. We don't, we don't get rich. We don't, we don't attain uh, wealth or happiness because somebody gives it to us. We, we get it because we earn it, because we realize and accept the fact that if we want to be successful in this world, we have to take some positive action. And unfortunately, when I see things like affordable housing, I instantly know how to translate that. When, they talk, when the government talks about afford, affordable housing, what are they really talking about? Well, it's either shoddy, it's either junk, which the government is fond of putting up or it's subsidized, which means it's not really affordable. It's just the, you are paying the bill for someone else to live in that house because of the, you know, the financial commitment that the government makes to subsidizing the housing to make it quote unquote affordable. And most of the time, if we're being truthful, it's a combination of the two. The government puts up shoddy housing that's way too expensive and overpriced, and then they subsidize the crap out of it to make it affordable for the poor to live in. And I look at that and I say to myself, well, why don't you, instead of doing that, why don't you instead put yourself and put these people into a position where they can actually start raising themselves out of poverty? Why don't we create from the beginning, if that's our intent, create from the beginning a process by which we make people self-sufficient? But that's not what the government wants to do. The government is constantly concerned about creating dependency, not independence. Government thrives. Our government, the, you know, the German government, the, the Canadian government, all government derives its power by taking control of people's lives and making them dependent. That's why the government wants to regulate, they want to, over, they want to oversee, they want to tax, they want to redistribute, because they know that every dollar that doesn't go into your pocket is a dollar that you have to go to them to get back. And then we have an education system that doesn't breed independence, but breeds dependence. What do we teach people when they go to school? Well, you need to get a good job and go to college and spend on overpriced education so that you can get out and get a good job that somebody else gives to you. Now, the truth is that not, not everybody is meant to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody is meant to own their own company. Some people just, they ought to be working as a computer programmer, or as a CAD designer. They ought to be sitting at a desk all day because that's really where their strengths lie. But the idea that we can't produce independent, self-sufficient people who understand things like personal finance and understand economics and, and, and who are put into a position where they have a chance of succeeding, we can absolutely do that in our education system. We just don't. And after talking with teachers for years and years and years, I'm convinced it's intentional. I'm not talking about the teachers in the school who are teaching your kids. They're running off the syllabus. They're doing what the government is telling them to do. I'm talking at the government level, at the Department of Education level, the idea is dependence. 
selling kids on that. Oh, everybody's a winner. We can't hurt them. We can't use red ink to market up the power. Everybody gets a trophy. I mean, that type of stuff is killing the spirit of entrepreneurship and independence in this nation. And it's not just here in New Zealand. This is, this is a quote from the new prime minister. She said, if you have hundreds of thousands of children living in homes without enough to survive, that's a blatant failure, she said. What else could you describe it as? And I say to myself, I, I, I have no doubt it's a failure, but it's not a failure of capitalism. It's not a failure of, of a free market system, because here's the crazy thing, guys. There is, this, is, this is undisputable. Absolutely, factually, you cannot argue with it. So you can tell this to anybody, and they, can, they have no retort. No system of government, no system of, uh, of, 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 of means of exchange has ever been devised by man that's better than the capitalist system. Capitalism is responsible for providing more wealth and more opportunity to more people than any other system devised by man. That cannot be disputed. Now, it doesn't mean it's the best system. It doesn't mean that we might not derive some new system that was going to be even more efficient and even going to be better for all of mankind. But we haven't found it yet. And unfortunately, we're not looking for that new system. What we're looking for is to retread old systems, old ideas. Centralized control, socialism, redistribution of wealth. We know how those stories end. We can look throughout history time and time again. And the the further we get away from liberty, the closer we get towards tyranny and control, the worse things get for everybody. There's this notion that if we just redistribute the wealth and we take from the rich and we give to the poor, that eventually what's going to happen is everybody's going to have a fair share because the rich are just going to keep working. And that way the poor are going to have a little bit. But what we find is not only do the rich, not, not only do the poor not get wealthier, they actually get poorer. A small handful of those in power become ultra wealthy. You want to talk about wealth inequality. Look at communist and socialist nations. Look at totalitarian regimes. Look at Venezuela. Look at Saudi Arabia. The further away we get from these principles of liberty, these ideas that guide us and guide the decisions about how we interact with society, how we interact with each other, how we the moral obligation that we have to one another, the further away we get from these ideas, the worse it becomes for everyone. Now, you may ask yourself, well, in the long run, Jason, what, what happens? Are we just going to, are we all going to, uh, uh, what if we get the, 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 Total, the kind of like the, the pinnacle of what you're talking about is, is anarcho-capitalism where, where everybody's just running around and there is no rules and there is no government and there is no state. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm not suggesting that everybody fend for, them, everybody fend for themselves with, with absolutely no structure or order. And truthfully, if you really talk about anarcho-capitalism, a, a, a true anarcho-capitalism, that's not what they're saying either. They're not suggesting that there should be no governments, there should be no order. They're saying that there should be no central planning. And maybe we don't ever get there. We're so far away from it now, I don't even think it's really worth talking about. But what I'm saying is we can all ride the bus in the direction we want to go. But ultimately what I want to get across to you as as we're, we're talking about this today is Capitalism is not the problem. Free market, the idea of li- the principles of liberty that we discuss on this show is, are not the issue. And it's not even an issue of one side caring and the other side not. In the end, what it's about is it's about all of us talking to each other and finding the very best solutions we can to help the most amount of people. And to do that, as I said, without hurting anyone and without taking anyone's stuff. And if we can agree on that very simple principle that we don't hurt people and we don't take our stuff, it can lay a foundation under which we judge all of the decisions that we make as individuals and as groups. So anyway, I, 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 that's kind of a I, I didn't I didn't intend to kind of go that direction with the show today, but 
Uh, we're going to get into this bribery plot from Hillary Clinton. I want to talk about that because I, from what I read, I don't understand why the Clintons aren't in jail right now. There must be some piece that I'm missing, but this kind of bombshell dropped when I was out uh, on the road and I was reading through it a little bit. And, and I, want to, I want to cover the highlights for you so you kind of understand what's going on. And then I'm going to throw my hands up and be like, well, I mean, if they're not arrested yet, they probably never will be. But we'll find out. But first, I want to tell you about SeatGeek. Guys, if you want to save money on concert tickets or on sporting events, the only place for you to go is SeatGeek. Just download the app. It's an app you put right on your phone. And you can see all the sporting events, all the concerts, all the important stuff that's happening around you. And it's super easy to buy tickets. Not only do they aggregate, they take all of the other prices from all of the other people. They put them in one place so you always get the lowest price on your tickets. But they also have color-coded seats of the stadium. So when you open up the app, it actually shows you an image of the stadium or concert area, arena that you're going to be in. And every single one of the seats that's available is color-coded. And you either have a red, uh, either red, which means the seat's overpriced for where it's at, or green, which means the seat's really well-priced for where it's at. And that means no matter what you can afford, you can get the absolute best seats for the money. Now, here's all you have to do in order to help this show out, in order to get yourself 20 bucks in your pocket. Just download the SeatGeek app and enter promo code STAPLETON today. That's promo code STAPLETON for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. Now, guys, that can be half a ticket. In some cases, it might be a whole ticket, depending on who you're going to go see. So go and download the SeatGeek app, go to the settings section, and go ahead and get yourself uh, $20 off your first purchase by entering the promo code STAPLETON. And hey, you get free stuff. It helps the show out. No reason why you shouldn't. So go do it today. All right. Let's unpack the uh, Russian bribe plot. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. I I mean, here's the thing. Either you're getting very distorted news about what this is because the right wing media is playing it up like it's the biggest thing that's ever happened. It's a huge bombshell and she ought to be in prison, yada, yada, yada. And the left, apparently, left wing media is completely ignoring the entire thing. So let's dive in. So the headline reads, FBI uncovers Russian bribe plot before Obama administration approves controversial nuclear deal with Moscow. Now, that is a mouthful. But let me read. I'm just going to read through kind of the highlights here so you guys get kind of an idea. This is out of the Hill. This is what everybody seems to be quoting in terms of the the, the news article, uh, the, the pertinent news article. And it says, before the Obama administration approved a controversial deal in 2010, giving Moscow control of a large swath of American uranium, the FBI had gathered substantial evidence that Russian that the Russian nuclear industry officials were engaged in bribery, kickbacks, extortion, and money laundering designed to grow Vladimir Putin's atomic energy business inside the United States. So this is not about them wanting to build more nuclear weapons it's not about them trying to acquire more uranium in order to in order to get ahead in the nuclear arms race because frankly we're already in a position of mutually assured destruction so i'm not uh, not terribly con- that's not really what this is about what this is about is money they want to be able as i'll read in a minute they want to be able to sell uranium back to the united states and so they're involved in a bribery plot in order to try and get approval from the government to do that so reading on it says federal agents used a confidential u.s witness working inside the Russian nuclear industry to gather financial records, uh, make secret recordings of intercept emails as early as 2009. So this is not new. This has been happening for seven, eight years or so. They've been tracking this. It says they obtained an eyewitness account. They obtained. They also obtained eyewitness accounts uh, backed by documents indicating Russian nuclear officials had routed millions of dollars to the U.S. designed to benefit former President Bill Clinton. And that is where the story gets really interesting. It's, it goes on to say, rather than bring immediate charges in 2010, however, the Department of Justice under, I believe this was Eric Holder, continued investigating the matter for nearly four more years. I guess they didn't have enough information. They just continued to investigate without doing anything. Now, there's lots of reasons why they may do that. That they may want to, they may be trying to build a case. They they could be they could be watching to see how far it goes because they want to try and implicate. They they want everybody in the mix. Like lots of times you run these really big multi year long operations so that you can make sure that you're actually 
getting as deep as you need to go. Because if you get the surface level people, it's kind of like when you're, when you're trying to get drug cartels, like you can pick up the guys off the street, but what you really want are the distributors and the suppliers. And you can't get that if you blow your investigation by announcing that by, by picking up all of the low level people, you've, you've got to be more delicate than that. So the fact that they were continuing to investigate is not in and of itself a, a kind of a smoking gun that says there's a problem. Um, but I, I just want to bring it to your attention that in 2010, they didn't bring charges. They continued for four more years to investigate. During that period, the Obama administration made two major decisions benefiting Putin's commercial nuclear ambitions. So the real problem was while they were conducting this investigation, they didn't bother to bring, according to this article, uh, this information to light to the Obama administration as they were planning these uh, potential commercial deals with uh, with Putin's people. It says the first decision that they made occurred in October 2010 when the State Department and government agencies on the Committee of Foreign Investment here in the United States unanimously approved the partial sale of, of a Canadian mining company, Uranium One, to the Russian nuclear giant Ros- Rosatom. And that gave Moscow control of more than 20% of America's uranium supply. So that deal was approved. The government had to approve that. And while the FBI is sitting on all of this information, it apparently either wasn't sharing it with, uh, with the Obama administration or it was. And there was this, this is just absolute crony capitalism on an international scale. The article doesn't reference that. And the truth is, th- we may not know. But according to them, this was not something that the FBI brought to the attention of the administration. Now, in 2011, the administration gave approval to uh, Rostam's it's Tenex, T-E-N-E-X, subsidiary to sell commercial uranium to U.S. US nuclear power plants. Now, before then, they'd been limited to selling uh, old uranium that they'd processed out of uh, depleted Soviet nuclear weapons. So... What the what the Russians wanted to do was they wanted to take control of a chunk of the uranium market that America draws from in order to sell that uranium to the United States. It was it was absolutely about money. And so what do you do? Well, you've got to get approval. So how do you go about doing that? Well, you got to bribe somebody. Somebody's going to have to get their pockets lined. And it's delicate because you really need some very, very high up people. You can't just bribe some senator or congressman, which they probably did as well. You really got to go deep. Now, a person speaking on uh, condition of anonymity said the Russians were com- compromising American contractors in the nuclear industry with kickbacks and extortion threats, all of which raised legitimate national security concerns. And none of that evidence got aired before the Obama administration made those decisions. So according to this source, this stuff did not come to light until uh, until much, much later. Now, Peter Schweitzer and the New York Times documented how Bill Clinton, and this is the, this is the really interesting part, documented how Bill Clinton collected hundreds of thousands of dollars in Russian speaking fees and his charitable foundation collected millions of donations from parties interested in dealing uh, in, in interested in the deal while Hillary Clinton was president I'm sorry, presided over the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States. So remember, she was the head of this group. The I don't know what I have no idea what the Committee on Foreign Investment actually does. It seems like a, another useless government uh, entity, but. For whatever reason, they were responsible for approving these deals. And so in order to get the deal done, this is what allegedly they say happened. Bill Clinton was offered big speaking fees by the Russians to come over. And the parties who were interested in getting the deal done donated millions of dollars to his charitable foundation. Now, the tough part with that is, and this is probably why they're not in bracelets right now, is how do you prove that connection? You, you would have to prove that there was a, a quid pro quo there, that they just didn't, you know, really want to come here, Bill Clinton, to come and speak, and that they just really didn't care about what Bill Clinton was doing in his charitable foundation. You, I mean, it's it's circumstantial. The, the, the tough part is, is it's all there, and any idiot can look at it and say, yeah, clearly. I mean, there's no other reason than the fact that Hillary Clinton was in the position she was in, and this was something that they could get done. But... Unfortunately, what do you do about that? 
says the Obama administration and the Clintons defended their actions at the time, insisting that there was no evidence of any Russians or donors engaged in wrongdoing. But FBI, Energy Department and court documents reviewed by the Hill show the FBI, in fact, had gathered substantial evidence well before the committee's decision. The problem, again, is that they didn't share that with anybody. A pair allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. And so we're in this we're in a position now where what are you going to do? You you've got you've got the smoke you've got all the you've got smoke you just can't see the fire. And so those who want to believe that it's clearly a scandal and that the Clintons are clearly engaged in corruption and using their position and authority and their their nonprofits to enrich themselves and and line their own pockets are going to believe that. And I happen I happen to believe that I I genuinely think that based on all of the evidence that I have seen that they're engaged in some very corrupt practices. I talked with a lot of people who work down in Haiti and the money that was generated and was supposedly supposed to go down there and the way the Clintons absolutely destroyed that and used that entire tragedy to line their own pockets. I have heard enough stories from people who work directly with it to know um that uh that uh you know to to uh, enough to know that or to believe that that's actually what's happening sorry i don't, I don't want to say i don't want to say i know because i don't really know but uh this is a story guys it's a it's a bit of a scandal and those who don't want to believe it who want to believe that the that the clintons see i don't even think the people i don't think that even the people who uh defend the clintons believe that the clintons aren't corrupt I think even if you like Bill, even if you like Hillary, you got to look at them and say they are two of the shadiest people still alive who have been in government. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let me tell you a little bit of stamps.com. Guys, if you're still going to the post office, shame on you because anything you can do at the post office, you can do from the comfort of your own home or your office. And guys, if you whether you own a small business or you work for a small business, if they're not using stamps, you you need you better tell somebody because it's really really important. You can use stamps to print any postage, any letter, any package, any class of mail using your own computer. They make it easy. They even send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage. How many times have you wondered whether it needed an extra stamp? Well, now you'll know because you'll have a free scale to go with it. Stamps will even help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. No need to lease expensive an expensive postage meter, which is how you used to do it. And right now, you can enjoy Stamps and, this, and their service with a special offer, including a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale with no long-term commitments. Here's how you do it. You go to Stamps.com, you click on the microphone in the top of the home page, and you type in my last name, Stapleton. That's Stamps.com, enter Stapleton. Stamps.com, never go to the post office again. I'm feeling fired up today. I feel, I feel good. I'm not going to lie to you. I feel good feels good to be back behind the microphone talking with you again. Darren is out today. If you're wondering why you don't hear Darren's voice, why we didn't have a, a live show today, it's because Darren is uh, is out. So we're going to we're gonna do without him for the day, and I'm going to fly this one solo. But let me talk to you. Uh, interesting article here about the polarization of Americans and, uh, and the mix of, I guess, conservative and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and liberal views. So the study was conducted by the Pew Research Center, and it started back in 1994. They did it once in 1994, and they've got another chart here from 2004, and then they've got one from 2017. And in 94 and 2004, you see slight shifts. In, in 94, it was a little more polarized, but you get this nice bell curve in in in, in kind of the, how people feel about different issues, and the, the median showing that hey, um, there's a lot of people who are uh, you know who are um, who are middle of the road, right? There's a, there's there's extremists on either side, but the bulk of the people kind of fall into this middle of the road where they pick uh, certain progressive stances on things and, and certain conservative stances on things, and that kind of lends itself to I guess more of a libertarian ideology. I don't I don't think of myself as being left or right. I see myself as as being um, liberty minded, and so it's not that I pick and choose based on how I feel. It's that I have a, a philosophy that's that is very socially liberal, I guess, and and very uh, physically conservative. Uh, if, if that, that's not even that's not even a really accurate way to say it, but it's close enough. 
And then in 2004, you see that uh, you, you see that peak even get higher and higher. Like even more people kind of fall into the middle of the road as to term as to their their liberal or conservative ideologies. And now we look at 2017, and it flatlines. It's 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 like somebody chopped off the top of the mountain to give you a kind of a visual representation of what the chart looks like. And you have a hill rather than a, a mountain with a peak, and it. it it says ide- ideological consistency, the, the shares of Americans holding liberal and conservative views across the wider range of issues is increasingly isolated with partisanship, a recent Pew Research Center shows. So not only are people not um, not as – I don't know if tolerant is the right word, but not only are they not holding – as uh, diversified of views of of life, but those the, that lack of diversity is tending to fall along political ideal political and ideological lines, and that that's a little scary to me, because one of the things that the government wants you to do, that politicians want you to do, is they want to isolate you into groups, they want to isolate you on political and ideological lines, so that they can then uh, create more. Um, what's the term? Uh, fanatical voters. Now, the truth is that we do this all the time in marketing and sales. It's one of the things that politicians seem to do really well is creating a sense of uh, fanaticism in whatever it is that you do. So in marketing or sales, like Apple is a great example. I mean, who's been, who's created more fanatical fans than Apple? I I mean, people stand in line to buy phone, to spend a thousand dollars to buy their phones. They, they, they are absolutely diehard fanatical people who will go to Apple and spend outrageous amounts of money. I happen to be one of them. I don't stand in lines, but I spend a lot of money with Apple. I really love their products. And all marketing and sales is really designed around doing that, creating this sense of, of desire and, and, and compelling people to buy. Politicians do the same thing. The way they do it is by by telling you that you you are isolated, that the other groups hate you, and the other groups want to take away your stuff. If you're on the left, they want to take away your. If you're on the right, they're, they they want to take away your guns. If you're on the left, they want to take away your social programs, and telling you that the only way to safeguard what you got, your quote unquote rights is if you support them and you you advocate for them and and you reelect them. And this kind of shows that. It says overall 32% of Americans now take a roughly equal view of conservative and liberal positions. That was 38% in 2015, and it was 50% in 2004. 50% of the people in 2004 held kind of a 50-50 view on uh, either Republican or part, you know liberal or conservative views, and now that's, that's totally changed. And I am uh, – it's disheartening. It's concerning to me as someone who promotes ideas that are not mainstream. So the idea that we have a group of people who listen to this show who genuinely, who genuinely believe we shouldn't hurt people and we shouldn't take their stuff, and, and you are comfortable with us melding the idea that you ought to be able to marry whoever you want to marry, and you also ought to be able to discriminate if you want to, are, are very, very different and very polarizing issues. But I, one of the things we've been able to do on this show is really, I guess, overcome that hurdle of taking the time to educate and walk people through and talk with them about why it doesn't work, why these ideas are the best ideas and, and why they produce um, better standards of living for everyone and better opportunity for everyone. And I, I don't think that most Americans – are coming around to this idea. I had hoped they would be. I, I, as, I, as I looked at this show when I started it three years ago, one of the things I kind of saw was I said that the youth, those who are in their 20s and you know late 20s, are, are looking at the world differently. And they do hold different views. They, they hold much more progressive views about what, the way you ought to live and interact in a society. And as they get older, my, my idea was, well, what tends to happen is people are really liberal or really progressive when they're in college. And then when they start actually making money, they become much more conservative because they realize how much is being taken away from them and how hard they're working only to see their wealth evaporate and go into the hands of somebody else. And 
what I thought was this is going to be a perfect time because over the next 10 to 20 years, as I hopefully continue to do this show, there's going to be that change. And those young people are going to start to come around to uh, the ideas of, uh, of social, uh, socially liberal and, and fiscally conservative. And I can be there to explain that to them. I can do the things that the education system is failing to do. And hopefully we can create an army over the course of many years, people who listen to this show and the ideas that we promote, that we can actually affect positive change in our society. That's what ultimately what I hope to do with this show. It wasn't just a money-making venture, although that's nice. It was really something that I wanted to do because I believe passionately in the ideas that we promote here. But this, uh, this Pew poll is, is a little disconcerting because what it says is we're not becoming – uh, more tolerant. We are not becoming more considerate uh, and we are not being more discerning in terms of our views. We're becoming more isolated. We're becoming more polarized. We're po- becoming more uh, politicized. And um, I don't know about you, but that scares me a little bit. It's both frustrating and scary. Um, and here's another great example of it. I mean, if you if you thought that Republicans, there was a, I, I want to believe that there was a time, and it must have been before I was following politics, but I want to believe that there was a time when Republicans truly were fiscally conservative. Because the idea that they promote is Republicans are conservative. They want to protect your money. They want tax cuts. They want uh, they they want to get rid of these social programs that are that are costing you money and that they don't work and are failing. They care about the government debt and deficits. And we put conservatives into office because we want them to do those things. But the truth of the matter is that conservatives don't want to do those things. They don't really have any desire to do those things. And a perfect example of it was Rand Paul's um, amendment to cut $43 billion in spending. Apparently, he just got done criticizing his fellow Republicans on Thursday after they rejected an amendment which would have saved said $43 billion in defense spending from the 2018 budget. He said, we have a $20 trillion debt. It's about whether, we seriously, uh, whether we're serious about tackling that debt. And he accused leaders of plan, uh, planning to hide additional funds in the war fund cash that is separate from the budget. It's known as the overseas uh, con- contingency operation in order to get past the caps. So what, the, what Republicans are doing, just to clarify, is they're using – the war funds cash, which is a separate budget from the one that they uh, that they approved, where they can funnel money so that they can get around the caps that are imposed and they can spend more. And what Rand tried to do was he tried to cut that money out. So there's forty three billion dollars here that you guys are you guys are hustling and we ought to cut this out of the budget. It's forty three billion dollars we don't need to spend and you guys are are acting you're you're conducting shady operations this is exactly the type of capital that's exactly the type of government that we all hate and unfortunately only four senators voter voted in favor of paul's amendment steve danes from uh montana jeff flack or is it flake or flack i think it's flack from arizona James Lankford from Oklahoma and Mike Lee of Utah, the only four senators to vote for his amendment. That means every single one of the other Republican senators wanted to keep that pork in there. And then Paul's spending cut ended up failing, but the budget passed 51 to 49. They did not get a a single uh, Democratic vote, I don't believe. And Paul was the only Republican to vote no. You want to talk about being a lonely man up there on the hill. Paul is most certainly that. The man, I mean, he's got some friends who are willing to stand up for him and vote for his amendment. But at the end of the day, he's the only guy who said no. He's the only guy who looked at the budget and said, this is wrong. It's one of the things that I, I, I asked Jerry Moran. I'm like, why do you vote for the budget? The budget's garbage. You know it's going to pass. Why do you vote for it? At least put your stamp on it and say, no, I'm not going to put my name on this. I don't want to be part of this. If you really care about being socially, uh, I'm sorry, uh, fiscally conservative, then why don't you stand up like Rand did and make a statement and say, look, I don't care whether you guys want me to vote for this or not. This is garbage. I'm not going to put my name on it. 
I'm truly living what I tell people I live. I am going to do the things that I promised my constituents I would do when I got elected. And there are just so few of them out there. It's absolutely frustrating to me. And that's one of the reasons I want to have uh, some of these guys on who are, who are running in primaries. Next year, I'm, going to, I'm, I'm running a, taste ca- a test case. We're going to have Shane Hazel on the show. He's one of the recorded interviews I'm going to do. And uh, we're going to have him out and talk with him a little bit about it and, and see what he has to say. He's running in Georgia, I believe. And he's one of those guys that really he listens to the show and he's anxious to, uh, to make some changes. And so if we can kind of expose these guys who are coming up in the primaries, who are running against some of these incumbents that aren't doing their jobs and who aren't living up to the, uh, to the campaign promises that they make, then maybe we can affect some change. If not, we're, we're going to be screwed. But anyway, let me tell you a little bit about Blinkist, guys. So you got six meetings today. You got 213 emails to respond to. You got 72 books that you promised yourself you've read, and they're sitting on a desk somewhere, and you haven't gotten to any of them and you got 15 minutes in your day, what are you going to do with it? Well, you can sit around and twiddle your thumbs, or you can go to Blinkist, and you can check out uh, 2,000 of the best-selling nonfiction books transformed into powerful packs that you can read or listen to in just 15 minutes. They actually have audio files, too, so even if you don't like reading, you can just play it and listen to it. It says... uh, And since you're listening to a podcast, you probably love the idea of learning on the go with your smartphone. Imagine if you could listen to the key insights of a nonfiction book in just 15 minutes. We're always talking about increasing your human capital, people. That's what you're doing when you go to Blinkist. So right now, Blinkist has a special offer for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com forward slash Stapleton right now and start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan when you join today. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Stapleton to start your free trial or get three months free off of your yearly plan. And guys, this is a super cheap thing. Like everybody can afford this. I, I can't remember what it costs, but it's uh, it was so ridiculously cheap. I I couldn't I couldn't believe it. So that's Blinkist.com forward slash Stapleton. And they got some great, I just got, uh, I think I got a couple of things in here. Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. If you've never read that book, it's a must read. The Four Hour Work Week, another book every human being on the planet should wa- should read. How to Win Flins, Friends and Influence People. Um, the Power of Habit, which I thought was a fascinating book that I read. These are just some of the ones that I have actually read. The 80-20 Principle I've read. Emotional Intelligence, The Bulletproof Diet, Smarter, Faster, Better. These are all really great books, and you can condense them down into just a 15-minute read. I've always said that most books have probably two chapters of valuable information, and the rest is just fluff because nobody wants to buy a 20-page book. But really, the, the meat of it is condensed into two chapters of probably 20 to 40 pages. And what they're doing with Blinkist is that they're finding those pieces and they're putting them into something that's easy for you to read and digest. So go check them out, Blinkist.com forward slash Stapleton. Another free thing that they offer here. All right. Last thing we're going to talk about today is Ray Dalio's recent post, uh, I think it was on LinkedIn, where he talked about uh, what he is calling the, what was it, the, the greatest the most important economic, uh, uh, political, and social issue of our time. So every quarter, the Fed flow of funds reports disclosures. Uh, Every quarter, the Fed's flow of funds report discloses, among many other things, the total household net worth. And every quarter for the past two years, that number has steadily gone up. And that's something that they point to is, oh, look, look, all the the total household net worth keeps increasing. And Zero Hedge in this article says, however, the the aggregate number is largely meaningless in providing uh, a status update on the financial health of the broader U.S. population as it masks the gap, uh, the growing chasm between the haves and the top 10 percent and the have nots in the bottom 90 percent. So they're talking about wealth inequality here. And they're saying, look, you can't look at everybody together and say, oh, look, everybody, everybody's getting richer. Household income on on the margin is growing. Because what's happening is while the top, really the top 20 to 30 percent are continuing to increase their their wealth and and continuing to advance, the bottom roughly 70 percent are really struggling to get by while we're having all kinds of other problems as it relates to uh, inflation and and cost of living increases, cost of education, cost of health care, all that stuff is going up. 
And so it says today, Bridgewater's Ray Dalio focused on just that topic, which he calls the most important economic and political social issue of our time. Dalio writes that the Federal Reserve should more closely monitor the economic struggles of the bottom 60% of the economy when making a policy since average statistics are camouflaging what really occurs in the U.S., precisely what the site, what the, their site claimed or Zero Hedge claimed uh, has been claiming quarter after quarter. Now, Dalio's core argument is the wide disparity in factors, including labor, retirement savings, health care, death rates, and education between the, bo- the top 40% and the bottom 60 of the country, and how average statistics fail to capture this increasing bimodal distribution. It says, the gap between the two economies will only intensify over the next five to 10 years as changes in demographics will change the government's ability to meet pension and health care demands, while changes in technology will continue to impact employment. Now, we have talked on this show, as you know, we don't do drive-by news here. We, I, I draw from other episodes, so if you are not caught up, please go take the 10-episode challenge. But we have talked on this show many times about the government's inability to meet its pension demands. So you've got a lot of people out there who think that they're good. They think they've got a pension. They think life is grand, but those pensions are dramatically underfunded. And there's absolutely no way that they're going to be able to fully fund them. And eventually what's going to happen is they're going to have to go to those folks that they've promised pensions to and say, we just don't have the money. And people are going to hoot and holler and they're going to raise their fists in the air and they're going to scream and shout and there's going to be nothing they can do. Because eventually... Join the conversation. Follow Jason on Twitter. And don't forget to visit the live show fan page on Facebook. 